Hi there, my name is Michael Bach. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I'm the CEO of CCDI Consulting and the founder of the Canadian Centre for Diversity and Inclusion and Pride at Work Canada. I want to thank IT World Canada for including me in today's event. The purpose of this session is to talk about a fundamental piece of LGBTQ2 plus inclusion, safe space, what it is, and more importantly, why it's so important. Without it, if your space is not safe, it cannot and will not be inclusive of LGBTQ2 plus peoples. For those of you that don't know me, I've been working professionally in the areas of inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility for over 17 years. I have also been a community activist in the LGBTQ2 plus communities for over 30 years. I wrote a couple books, Birds of All Feathers, Doing Diversity and Inclusion Right, and Alphabet Soup, The Essential Guide to LGBTQ2 plus Inclusion at Work. Both are bestsellers. That doesn't mean they're any good, just that we've sold a lot of copies. They're available wherever you buy books, as long as they're selling mine, or you can go to michaelbach.com to find out more. I want to start by defining what I mean by safe space. To figure that out, I'm going to start with a definition. My friends at Merriam-Webster define safe space as a place intended to be free of bias, conflict, criticism, or potentially threatening actions, ideas, or conversations. The reference in the definition to college campuses is an accurate one in that we often hear discussion about safe space in the academic world. However, the concept of safe space stems from gay and lesbian bars in the mid 1960s. At the time, queer bars were often the only place where LGBTQ2 plus people could exist without fear of violence or harassment, often from police. A safe space is just like it sounds a space where a person is able to exist without fear of judgment, discrimination, abuse, and violence. That can be a workplace, a community center, a restaurant, a place of worship, a hospital, or a college or university. It's not about having a special room where a person can go to be safe. It's about the entire space being safe. It's about being in a space where you're able to be yourself, without having to look over your shoulder. So let's talk about why it matters, because it does matter. As I talk about in the book, safe space is the cornerstone of LGBTQ2 plus inclusion. Without it, you failed before you begin. Sometimes it's hard for people to understand that some spaces are not safe, particularly if those people are in the majority. Most women who have been sexualized or objectified or who have otherwise been the target of sexism understand it. Most people of color understand it, having experienced subtle or overt acts of racism. Most people with disabilities understand it, having been forced to navigate a world that is designed for the able-bodied. And most LGBTQ2 plus people understand it because even if they have never personally experienced violence or discrimination because of their sexual or gender diversity, They've certainly witnessed it. Keep in mind that homosexuality was only removed as a psychological disorder from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, that really rolls off the tongue, in 1973. In Canada, homosexuality was decriminalized in 1967, thanks to our current Prime Minister's father, who introduced Bill C-150 and uttered those famous words, there's no place for the state in the bedrooms of the nation. In the United States, Illinois effectively became the first state to decriminalize homosexuality by repealing its sodomy law. That happened in 1961. However, it wasn't until 2003 when Texas's homosexual conduct law was struck down by the U.S. Supreme Court, which also invalidated similar laws in about a dozen states. So up until 2003, homosexuality was effectively illegal in about a quarter of U.S. states. There are many other dates and numbers that I could share that paint a picture of what it's like for LGBTQ2 plus people. But let's look at four numbers that articulate today's lived reality. 71, 43, 11, 15. There are 71 jurisdictions that criminalize private, consensual, same-sex sexual activity between men. Almost half of those countries are commonwealth jurisdictions. 
43 jurisdictions criminalize private consensual sexual activity between women. There are 11 jurisdictions in which the death penalty is imposed, or at least a possibility for private consensual same-sex sexual activity. Lastly, there are 15 jurisdictions that criminalize the gender identity and or expression of trans people. Now you're probably thinking, who cares? I can't even find Chad or Comoros on a map. But have you ever been to Barbados, Jamaica, St. Lucia? There are a lot of countries where it's illegal to be LGBTQ2 plus that you may be familiar with. For LGBTQ2 plus people, we have to consider whether or not where we're going, whether for pleasure or for work, is a safe space. Or could we end up in jail? And I don't do jail because I do not do orange. Makes me look like a creamsicle. This is our lived reality. While Canada is a safe place, at least legally, there are parts of the world that still criminalize who we are. One thing to keep in mind when you're thinking about the inclusion of LGBTQ2 plus people is that we are the invisible minority. That means that many members of the community can be in your organization and you might not know it because we aren't open about our identity. Many recent studies have looked at how many LGBTQ2 plus people are out at work, and the consensus is that between 46 and 69% of LGBTQ2 plus people are not out at work. Keeping that in mind, you have to be explicit in your actions to ensure you're sending the message of LGBTQ2 plus inclusion. Creating safe space shouldn't be a reaction to someone asking for it. Let's look at how you can make your space safe for LGBTQ2 plus people. Again, it's not about having a special section of your workplace covered in rainbow flags. It's about making sure that every part of your workplace is safe. It's not about a physical space as much as it's about a culture shift. So let's look at the building blocks of what it takes to have a safe space. First and foremost is policies. Think of these like the foundations of a house. Are your policies LGBTQ2 plus inclusive? What you say in your policy sends a strong message about safety and being welcome. Policies are one thing, but next comes your procedures. How do your policies get operationalized? For example, your recruiting process. Do you use standard questions in all your interviews? You should. Consistency is really important to ensure that that policy is executed as intended. Language also sends a very strong message. Many LGBTQ2 plus people are experts at reading between the lines. If we see language like he slash she in a policy or document, it sends a message that the organization is still thinking of gender as a binary of man and woman we may start questioning if your workplace is safe or if we should hide our identity. Ensure the language you use in policies and statements is explicit. Education is a critical component of safe space. It's important to make sure everyone, and I mean everyone, understands the fundamentals of what LGBTQ2 plus inclusion is, what a safe space is and why it's important and what their role is in ensuring their space is safe. Safe Space Champions is a leading practice that I'm a big proponent of, although I don't actually see it used often enough. The idea is to create a specific program that trains people to be safe space champions. This goes beyond education to turning people into active allies, responsible for ensuring your space is safe. It should go without saying, but I'll say it anyway. You need to have a zero tolerance policy. But beyond just having a policy, you actually have to enforce it. I've never seen an organization that completely enforces their zero tolerance policy. There were always more exceptions to the rule than actual enforcement. And I actually believe that's okay. Situations of homophobia, transphobia, and biphobia are rarely black and white. However, when it comes to overt homophobic, transphobic, and biphobic behavior, you need to enforce your policy without exception. Symbolism is also important. 
as LGBTQ2 plus people, we're very attuned to look for symbols that tell us we are safe. The pride flag is a universal symbol that tells us we're in a spa safe space. So put the flag up and do it in a very visible way. The only thing I'll caution you about with symbolism is that you can't do it in isolation. If you hang a rainbow flag without doing the heavy lifting of education and policy work, you may find you have an increase in homophobia, transphobia, and biphobia. Putting up a rainbow flag doesn't make a space safe on its own. Celebrations are a key component of safe space because they bring people together in that safe space. Who doesn't love a celebration? Pride is the most obvious celebration. Every employer I know throws a pride party in June. It's exhausting. Here's a little secret. I'm going to be gay in July. And August and September and pretty much every day of the year. There are lots of dates on the LGBTQ2 plus calendar that you could choose to celebrate. International Day Against Homophobia, Transphobia, and Biphobia is May 17th. National Coming Out Day is October 11th. Another component of safe space that I love to see is signage. And I mean literal signage that says that a space is safe. You can use this as part of your new Safe Space Champions program. Once a person has gone through the Safe Space Champions training, you can provide them with a sign they can hang in their workspace to send a message to everyone that they're there to support safe space. I want to leave you with some tangible takeaways of things you can do to create safe space. It's one thing for organizations to create safe space. They can put up signs and introduce policies, but the reality is that safe space is a very individualistic act. An employer can say a space is safe, but if the people in that space haven't bought in, then the space is not, in fact, safe. Creating a safe space requires individuals like yourselves to step up and engage. It requires people, particularly if those people are straight and cisgender, to make it clear that the space is safe. The first individual action you can take is simply to get involved. Not to get all brain science-y, but if we look at how our brains work, we tend to be drawn toward people who have an affiliation with. What that translates to is we often find ourselves being passive in our approach to inclusion. The second individual action is to stand up to inequity. When you hear a joke or comment, regardless of whether or not an LGBTQ2 plus person is around to hear it, and no matter what the intention was, you have to make it clear that sort of language is inappropriate. Add your pronouns into your email signature and online profiles. It's a great way to create safe space. I know this seems like a really small thing and you might not understand why it matters, but it has a big impact. By putting your pronouns in your email signature and saying them at the start of a meeting, as I did today, you're sending a message to everyone else that this is a safe space for others to share their identities. Creating safe space is not about relying on others to take the first step. It's your responsibility to educate yourself. It's not my job to educate you. Okay, well, technically it is my job to educate you, but it's not the job of every LGBT2 plus person to educate you. Read a book like mine or an article, watch a TV show, have a conversation. You don't need to do a master's degree in fabulousness, although I have and it was super fun. What you need to do is ensure that you have a solid understanding of sexuality and gender so you don't say something inadvertently that offends someone. Put up your own sign. If your organization isn't at the point of having a Safe Space Champions program, take it upon yourself to create your own Safe Space sign and post it in your workspace. Make it clear to your colleagues that in your space, it will be safe and make sure they understand what that means and what is expected of them. Last but certainly not least, if you don't know what to do, ask. There is zero expectation that you're gonna ride in on your white steed and save the day. No one is asking you to be a savior. If you wanna be a safe space champion, ask your LGBTQ2 colleagues and friends what you can do to help and then do it. 
it's not that complicated. The worst thing you can do is decide what others need. We have a long history of that in this country and it never works out too well. So to wrap it up, I have six things you can do to help ensure your space is safe. Engage, step up and be active, share your pronouns, educate yourself, put up a sign and ask. If every one of you were to do these little things, you would ensure that your workplace was safe for LGBTQ2 plus people and you would be the envy of employers everywhere. I wanna thank you so much for your time and I hope you enjoy the rest of today.